Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Well, we are in one of the more difficult portions of scripture in the Bible. And we try not to avoid those at Calvary and uh, make sure we understand them. <laughs> and uh, Paul's letter, in, we're in Ephesians 6, if you want to turn your Bibles there. Paul's letter to Ephesus, he doesn't shy away from difficult things because he's dealing with difficult things in his context. And remember, in the first message of this entire series, we learned that he wrote this in AD 60 to 64. So things have changed. Um, although, you'll hear and see a little bit about how things have not completely changed. But we're on the topic of, of slaves and masters today. And so it's not an easy subject for the church to teach on and talk about. It's a, a sensitive one. But we're going to talk about it from the Roman slavery perspective and what Paul was dealing with. And I just want us to do something. Uh, we're going we're gonna to jump into the deep end in the beginning of this message. And then we're going to come swimming to the surface on the shallow end. And then walk out the steps and hopefully live out what we can in today's context. Sound right? Sound good? What can we, what can we apply today? And that's what we're going to do. And, and so it's important that we read the scripture first so we can understand where we're headed with the teaching here. So Ephesians 6, verse 5. Paul is talking to the Christian church, and he's talking to Christian slaves and Christian masters at this time. And he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. In other words, serve them because you are serving Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. So he's saying here that you're a believer in Christ, and so I want you to do your best in the situation you're in. I want you to serve the best you can because you're doing it for Christ too, and I want you to show Christ to your master. I want, I want, to sh I want you to show Jesus to your master. He goes on to say, work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. So do it as if you're doing this for God. Remember that the Lord will reward each of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Then he says, masters, he gets into the masters. Now, if you were to be in this context, this would be a radical scripture. For anyone to tell masters what to do at this context in first century A.D., it would make everyone's ears kind of perk up and eyebrows go up and go, did he just say that? He says this, masters, treat your slaves in the same way with dignity, respect. In other words, the golden rule, do unto others as you have them do unto you. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven and he has no favorites. So the master was under God. This, the serv, servant or the slave was under God. And so they're both under God, even the master. And so it's important that he treats them the way God would want them to treat them. So we're in a time where Paul is writing to a church under the oppression of Rome. In fact, it's so bad that we all know this is a prison epistle, a prison letter. Paul is in prison under Rome guard why, though? Because the Jewish community that didn't like the Christians uh, conspired against Paul, came up with some false claims, and he was arrested. And so the, the power of Rome is so dominant at this time that everyone was enslaved under Rome practically. It was bad. You ready for this? 60 million slaves at this time. One-third, and this is the first century, one-third of the population were slaves at this time. Roman citizens, they had a really off look at their own life. They were off, real bad, obviously. But they looked at themselves as they were, it was too beneath them to work. That's too, that's not, we're, we're better than working. And so they literally enslaved 
even doctors, even doctors were slaves, even um, teachers were slaves, and some of the emperor's secretaries who dealt with money and finances and appeals in court were slaves as well. That's how bad it was then. Um, as Rome conquered many nations, they enslaved their prisoners and had them do the work for them. So they didn't enslave one race or nation. They enslaved everyone that they conquered. So that's why there were 60 million slaves at that time. Now, some slaves uh, were, were treated like family. Uh, Pliny the Elder, a Roman author, naval and army commander, he lived between AD 23 and 79. He actually offered his slaves a living will. Um, for many, the only way of survival at this time to, make, uh, to have any kind of food or place to live was to be a slave because, again, they were prisoners. Uh, the other option would be to die. And so many of them actually went into slavery just to survive. That's how bad it was. And while there may have been a few masters who treated their slaves well, for the most part, it was bad. For the most part, they were treated inhumanely. And it's the big question that a lot of people come to the Bible with in this scripture is why did Paul, why did Paul instruct the Christian slaves and masters to conduct themselves as if he's okay with slavery? Well, he's not okay with slavery. He's in a situation where he has no fight, so to say, from his position in prison under Roman guard. Their, their power and influence was so dominant. It was so common. Slavery was so common at that time. It would be, it was their entire workforce. And like electricity is to us, slavery was to the Romans, and it's terrible. It was terrible. And this is the, this is the setting that Paul is in. And Paul was in no position, he was extremely outnumbered to attempt an abolitionist movement, um, you know, a physical one. In fact, if Rome caught uh, anyone of any kind of civil opposition or disobedience, they would just stomp them out and kill them all. That's what they would do. And at the same time, the, the Jews that were against Christians like Paul and the church in Ephesus, the Jews, they had already conspired against Paul and said that he, they would tell Rome that this movement, this Christian movement, they're trying to overthrow Rome. They're trying to fight you physically. That actually wasn't the case. The Christian movement was blowing up and it was expanding spiritually through people's hearts. And yes, that would change people's physical behavior. This is what Paul had to wrestle with. So if I could liken it to a balance beam, Paul is on this balance beam between the Jews who hate him, who are anti-Jesus and Christian, and the Roman oppression, and he's trying to just do what he can while in prison, shackled, chained. You know how hard this would be to be a leader? So what does he say to his church? He gives them instruction on how to at least treat each other now that you are under one master, and that is God. Now, Paul was called to preach repentance and belief in Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. And he's preaching to Roman citizens who would have been masters, as well as citizens of Ephesus who were slaves. The gospel doesn't discriminate, church. The gospel came for all people. And so all people were getting saved. And so Paul had to address this in hopes to help them get through this very difficult situation that they're in. The gospel came to set people free from sin that enslaved them. And here's a key thing I wrote down. The gospel wouldn't transform the civil laws directly, but it would transform hearts that would eventually change the laws of the land. The way Paul would reform society would be to transform hearts who legislated the injustice. So if he can change their hearts, perhaps they would change their laws. And overall, the message of the gospel, if anyone asks why doesn't Paul condemn it, well, he, he, he really kind of does. He just doesn't say it outright in that scripture. But in Galatians chapter 3, he says this in verse 26. For you were all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes, so a new identity as a Christian. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, 
And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. In other words, in God's eyes, in, in Christians' eyes, we are all one. We are all equal. That is so important that we take that away today. And that's how Paul felt about it. So one salvation at a time, one day at a time, Rome would change. And slavery would, would slowly go away. And their power would diminish. And Paul did not ignore the situation altogether. Instead, Paul instructed the slave and the master how to respect one another and shine for God in this unfortunate reality. And the instruction from Paul in their day and time, when Paul said these, these verses, it was a radical step forward in the kind of oppression that they were in at this time. So this is where I'm next. I gave you some history of how difficult this context was at that time. Now I want to share with you what Paul instructed them to be like around each other. So when a slave was, a Christian slave was at his master's home, how should he live, he or she? And if a master was a Christian, how should he treat his slaves? And that's what Paul gets into. And I, I want to teach it just so that we can understand scripture, even though today it doesn't necessarily apply to us at all. Although, did you know today in modern slavery, there are 40 million slaves? 40 million in a variety of different ways around our world. It's estimated 40 million slaves in modern day slavery. And one of them in particular is the human trafficking and the sex slave trade. And later, we're going to have our fine arts team, our youth team, do a human video to show you an example of that story. And it's a, it's a powerful message. This is a heavy message, isn't it? It's a heavy message, but it's, it's important to understand. We're still in the deep end. Are you, are you okay? Anyone need any floaties? <laughs> I'm helping us guide us through that. So let me, let me go to the next part. So Paul encouraged Christian slaves to serve their masters in three ways. One, obey and serve your masters as if you're serving Christ. So look past the masters and look at, do this for God. Do it for God. Work hard even when no one is watching. Paul uses a Greek word that has to do with eye service. Don't just do eye service. Please, God, God is watching you. God is watching you, so serve well in your difficult circumstance. Work with enthusiasm as if you're working for the Lord rather than people. The Greek word here it's used it has this, this tone of eagerness. Uh, don't wait to be compelled or told to work. Work hard no matter what. One scholar wrote this, to work diligently when the earthly master isn't watching or to work enthusiastically and without force was in a sense to transcend their slavery and live as if they are free agents in those moments. That's powerful. Think about that for a moment. Because they're, they're free in Christ. They are not a slave to God. But to the master, the human master, he sees them or her as a slave. And so what Paul is saying is work without being told to work so that you are free. Work enthusiastically. Don't be told to work. Do it so well that as if you are free because you are free in Christ Jesus. In other words, it's like a job. Work your job even though you're being treated so poorly. And again, some homes, they were treated well. Even treated as family. Some slaves were inherited into the family, which is really cool, but still a terrible situation to be in. Work with enthusiasm. Now, the goal would be to make Christ attractive in their difficult circumstance. Serve in such a way that people would be, the master would see a difference in you, in that person. And so one piece of papyrus scroll, so a lot of the Bible is written on papyrus scrolls, and they actually found a historical papyrus scroll. And on this piece, it was dated in AD 157, where a master freed five slaves because of their goodwill and affection towards their master. And that was the goal, is that it would change the heart of masters if slaves would serve them as if they were serving Christ and doing it all for the glory of God. And so it was hopeful that they would change uh, the hearts of people around them. Now he goes into verse eight and he says this, there is reward for doing good in serving God 
in all circumstances. There is a reward. God will reward them for the good they do, whether slave or free. The Christian slave could cheerfully serve even, as a, even for an unreasonable master, knowing that his or her reward will come from Christ as if they're serving Christ. In other words, serve because you are going to get a reward, he's telling the church, and it's going to come from Christ. It's going to be better than what your earthly master could ever give you. And then secondly, the slave or free are promised the same inheritance in Ephesians 1, 3 through 11. We read about that in our first few messages that everyone who believes in Christ inherits eternal life. We're adopted. We receive the blessings of God, the help and the power of God. This is for all people. Now picture this for a moment. Picture that you're at church, first century AD, and a Christian master comes to church under the same roof of a Christian slave. And this time, the master is serving his slave over dinner. This time, the master is getting down washing feet, because they still did that, because their feet were dirty, coming to a dinner party, coming to church. And imagine seeing a master now serving at the table and sitting right next to a slave because they're equal. That's what the gospel was doing in the midst of such an oppressive environment in Rome and under Roman rule. <clears throat> it's powerful. And so that's what they were experiencing. And they were having a breakthrough in the church of them coming together and loving one another. Now, Paul then addresses Christian Masters, he advises them to conduct themselves with grace in two ways. He reminds them to treat them as you would want to be treated. Unfortunately, under Roman slavery, people were treated as just tools and objects. They were not treated with dignity. And so Paul is saying, treat them as if you want to be treated. However you want to be treated, treat them. Treat them as a person. Listen, at this time, whether you were a slave or free, at this time, you were, you die, Jesus died for that person. And they also inherited eternal life and everything from God. And Paul is saying, treat them as a person, not as an object or thing or a piece of property. Again, this would be very radical. Um, the pagan Christian uh, the pagan uh, masters at this time, they would treat their slaves so cruelly and so viciously, it was terrible. And Paul was saying to these Christian masters, don't you dare treat them the same way. Don't you dare do that. Now here's what it could have looked like if the master and the slave were in some form of unity because of what Jesus was doing in that time. This is what one scholar said. He said, it would be of mutual confidence and respect. The master would become the protector, the teacher, the guide. You ready for this? Even the friend. The servant would become the faithful helper, rendering service to the one whom he loved and to whom he felt himself bound by the obligations, not of slavery, but of gratitude and affection. In other words, Paul was praying and hoping that the result would be that masters would entreat their slaves as a slave but as a friend, and that those who served and were making their livelihood through this setting, that they would serve their masters also as a friend and out of gratitude. And it was this kind of relationship that would lead to emancipation, to freedom. It would be that. But Paul says this too. Sorry right here. Remember that although you are a master of men, you are still a servant of God. God does not show favoritism. Paul had to make sure that masters understood that you have a master too, and that master is God, and you serve him. And how you serve God is how you need to make sure you serve your, sl your slave or servant. This is some heavy stuff, isn't it? What a balance beam kind of life Paul had to live through as he's in prison. Paul's reminded that 
that masters, God is over them, but a master's submission to God would be to treat their slaves with grace, gentleness, and generosity that God shows them. And the reality is that many masters would set their slaves free because of Christ. And we praise God for that. Now let's come out on the shallow end a little bit. How do we apply this to today? Well, this is really, it's, it's, it was an awkward thing to study, but the only thing that today that scholars or theologians or commentaries would say is that there are principles in the workplace of how we can apply them. How should we conduct ourselves at work? For many, for many servants and slaves, it was a workplace environment for them. And so you can see these principles of working with their master well and the master treating their slaves with respect and love. So how do we bring that to today? You guys ready to come out of the shallow end? Anyone scared of the deep end? So there's two reasons that the work ethic of Christians should be the best in the workplace. We're going to talk about that. How should we be in the workplace as Christians? Some of us, by the way, are in very difficult workplaces. Amen? Careful, your bosses might be here. <laughs> Some of you may be the boss and the supervisor, and your supervisor over you is difficult. Or maybe you have a difficult... By the way, I'm, I'm a supervisor. I'm a boss. And sometimes it is hard to oversee so many employees. And it's because people have to work, but they also have their lives and they're going through a lot. And so as bosses, we have to be really careful. So I'm getting ahead of myself. But how should we as Christians work in the workplace? How should we shine? Here's the point. What Paul is trying to say in this entire scripture to the slaves and the masters is to shine God in the midst of that difficult context and circumstance. So that people would be changed. So that lives would be changed. The same thing for us today. We work hard and with enthusiasm because we're working for and to glorify God. When I work, when you work, we're doing it to glorify God. And so when I work, I want to work hard. Now, I'm not going to overwork too much, even though I have a problem with that. I need to chill. But we work hard because we want God to be glorified. We want to do our best, in other words and do it with excellence. The other reason, though, we can do it and be so, so good at work and show such a strong work ethic is because our motive for working hard isn't to receive earthly recognition or rewards. So when there's no earthly recognition, when your supervisor or boss is not seeing how good you're doing, guess who is? God is. We work hard because we know God sees us even when others don't. We work hard knowing we will be recognized by the Lord and master of the universe. He's got more authority than anyone else in the world. A generous reward with an eternal priceless inheritance is waiting for us from God. The promise in verse 8 is that if we do it all for the glory of God, we will be greatly rewarded one day. And it's the same thing here. Do you feel overlooked? God sees you. When I was praying about this message, because obviously this is a difficult message to teach on, I was like, how do we apply this? And of course I had help from other scholars and people who've preached before, but when it came down to it, I really felt like some people do not, they feel like they're not seen that all the hard work you do in the workplace is not seen, but God sees it and a reward is waiting for you that will never perish. No rust, no moth can destroy it. It's waiting for you and it's gonna be an awesome. By the way, earth rewards only last as long as earth does. But eternal rewards last forever. And that's what God has for all of us Every single person, God has that. So that's why we work so hard. And I've heard amazing stories of how people want to hire Christians in their workplace because they're working so hard and they do such a good job. So I encourage you to do the same. So you ready for this? I'm going to give you a few tips. I'm telling you, we're really coming out on the shallow end now. 
and now we're walking on the steps. And we're coming out, and we're going to walk this out. Now, I can't promise that these practical tips at work will help you elevate or get promoted. I can't promise you that. But this is what we can do for God at work and let his favor promote you. Let God promote you. Let God elevate you. Let God give you heavenly rewards. Sound good? I'm telling you, like, God, I, I prayed in the first service, may God's favor be upon you. In other words, everything you do, be successful. Because God gives it to you. Amen? So here, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you a few tips for employees and a few tips for us supervisors out there in our world of how we can conduct ourselves in the workplace. Number one, work harder than everyone else in the room, even when no one is watching. Work harder. William Barclay said, the conviction of the Christian employee is that every single piece of work he produces must be good enough to show God. Wow. College students, you're writing those papers. You're done now. Praise Jesus. Thank God you're out of colleges. Thank you. You guys, let's give a hand to all our college graduates. This is awesome. High school too. High school graduates. When I present that paper <laughs> to my professor, I'm presenting it to God. That's what Paul is trying to say. Transcend the earthly. Think about the eternal. Do it all. Do everything you do for God. Go above and beyond. Go above and beyond. If your boss asks you to go a mile, give him two. Or her. Give him or her two miles. Be punctual and thorough. How many live by the rule that if you're early or if you're on time, you're early? Eight o'clock is actually 7.45. To be on time, in other words, 7.45, Right? Maybe that's the way you, you practice. Maybe you get off at 5, you stay till 5.15 just in case. Clean up your desk, organizing it, making sure you're good, making sure no one else needs help. Strive to help your boss and company thrive. That was about the same reaction I had the first service. <laughs> but Ryan, my boss and my company, they are wearing me out. That may be true, and it may be a time for a change. But while you're there, shine God by striving to help your boss and company thrive. I'm not going to say, I don't mean this in a, in a superficial way, but make your boss look good. Like if he's got a presentation and it's your part to do, to do something, make it look sharp, make it look good, you know? Make him, help him or her succeed. Do something, go above and beyond for your boss and, and your company. So next list, help other employees be successful. Serve others around you. If you're working so hard to get all your work done, guess what you can do? You can go, if, if, you're, if your coworkers want your help, right? If your co I know this is very sensitive and difficult to apply sometimes in some settings, but apply what you can. Help other employees be successful. Do jobs no one else wants to do. I went to a, to a Wawa recently. No, it was a rural farms on the way home this past Tuesday from a pastor's trip. And I was like, man, someone needs to clean this bathroom real bad. Sometimes we got to get dirty and do the job no one else wants to do. Because it shines God. Not because you're going to get a promotion out of it, but because you're showing what good work ethic would be. A team player. Be a team player. Seven, work enthusiastically with a good attitude in every situation. Let me tell you, one of the best things we can do is, even if something is hard, to do it with a good attitude. How many of you, I'm, don't raise your hand, but how many of you don't like it when someone does it, but they're doing it with an attitude the whole time that's mean or bitter, right? Don't do it with bitterness. That's not what Christ would do. Do it with joy. Even if you have to bite your lip. Mm. This face. Number eight, always speak well of your place of employment and your supervisor. Newsflash, Facebook is public, just so you know. Uh, Instagram, Snapchat can be public. Screenshots are dangerous because someone will save your post about your workplace. Just be careful 
about what you say in the kitchen, next to their water cooler, wherever you are, by someone's desk, people can hear you more than you think. And can you trust everyone? Not all the time. Serve, work. He told the slaves at that time, work as if no one's watching. Talk as if everyone's listening. It's a great practice as an employee at an office. Talk as if everyone's listening. Guess who is listening? God. Have that kind of attitude at your work. All right, so supervisors, you're not off the hook. You ready? Here we go. Be considerate and empathetic to the needs of your employees. Don't overwork. We shouldn't overwork our employees. Uh, remember, this is all about glorifying God at work. So as supervisors, we want to show God while we're at work. Some of you may not be allowed to explicitly say things about God, but you can show God as a supervisor and as employees. Be gentle and gracious with subpar work. Sometimes people are going to deliver a product and it's not the way it should be, but sometimes that's because someone's going through a lot. And so we have to be careful as supervisors and bosses to make sure that we're being gracious and understanding and finding out, having that relational uh, that relate so in here in our church staff um, staff and office, we we check on each other relationally, not just performance and work. It's not about just the performance of a product; it's about the person behind it and what they're going through. Third, employees are not a means to an end for your success. Supervisors, bosses, help your employees succeed too. It's not all about us. Lead by example and not from behind a desk. Does that sound good? Lead by example. Pastor Kuhn always did this. When snow hit the ground in Delaware, you would find Pastor Kuhn shoveling snow. Wait, isn't he the lead pastor of the church? It doesn't matter to Pastor Kuhn. We are humble servants in God's eyes. Right? Is that trash on the ground? Well, I'm not going to wait for a janitor to pick it up. I'm going to pick it up. Right? That's, that's how we function as Christians. That's even how supervisors should function. It's not beneath a supervisor to do something like that. Because we're serving God now. See, recognize, and express. It's so important that we do all three of those. That we don't just see it, but we say something about it, and then we express appreciation for your employees. Who would love a boss like that? Compliment, encourage, and build up at the workplace. Show dignity and respect to all positions. Jesus would love a janitor just as much as a top salesman. Wouldn't he? He would care about his life or her life and talk and love them just as much as anyone else. And if you have the means to do it, if you have the position as a boss or a supervisor, if your workplace has the means to do it, Reward generously when possible. Sometimes here, we're so nonstop that we've had to tell our staff to take a day off because that's just healthy. And sometimes we rewarded them with days off for working so hard during really busy seasons. We, I don't know if you know this, but we're, we're not operating just on Sunday. We're operating seven days a week here. Uh, it, and it's no joke. It's serious. And we have an amazing staff. Can we give God some glory and praise for our staff real quick? <laughs> praise God. Thank you, Lord. And we had a beautiful uh, funeral ceremony yesterday here at 11 o'clock. You know, and it was an important time for Norma Ross. Her, she lost her husband, Brian, uh, to dementia and such. And so it was a, an important celebration for him going to be with God. So this is how we can apply this, at least in today's terms. But as I said before, we also are dealing with something in our world where human trafficking and modern day slavery is still taking place. And one local ministry called Zoe Ministries is fighting against that. But one other ministry that we work with as a church is Project Rescue, who also works with that. But this church is fighting for lives to be free, not just spiritually, but physically. Amen. So 
I'm going to have the students come on out and grab the table and the TV because they're going to come up here. And let me explain what they're going to do is they are going to do a what we call a human video where they're going to be acting out based off the music and the words, a scene of, a, of what it could look like for someone caught up in sex slavery. And um, thank you so much for going into the deep end with me, coming out of the shallow end, but we can still fight for those who are enslaved in our world. And just remember this, that whether, while there is physical slavery, there's also spiritual slavery. People are enslaved by sin, by fear, by worry, by doubt, and we're called to share the gospel, to set them free, share Christ. So live like that at work. Uh, come on out and grab the table. Uh, I want to tell you this quick story. I was out here uh, talking to some, some of our members of the church, and one of them said that one of his friends reached out to him after years, and he said, hey, brother, I just want to let you know my wife was dealing with cancer, and we prayed. And this guy, this Christian who attends here, he said, Ryan, he would never talk about God. And he said, we started attending church. He called this gentleman from our church because that guy lived like Christ at work every day. And so he reached out to him for prayer and to talk. Yeah, that's awesome. And then I met a brand new guest today. And I'm nervous for any guests who are here today because what a heavy message to hear the first Sunday here at Calvary, right? And I met a guest, her name was Hazel. And she said, today I need to hear that message because I was ready to be out of that workplace. I, I'm just not happy. I just told my husband I wanna work in a place that I could be happy. And that message spoke to me and said, I need to shine Christ in the situation I'm in right now and let God lead me out of there or stay there. And I thought, wow, how, what a powerful testimony today. So praise God for that. Well, let's give it one more hand for our team, the fine arts team. Thank you.